Hello, and welcome to the Diane Ream Book Club. I'm Lynn Kronberger, the Chief Development Officer here at WAMU, and we are so thrilled you could join us as Diane and her panel have an in-depth conversation about truth and facts and the ways in which they are manipulated for political gain in 1984 by George Orwell. First published in 1949, 1984, uh, this classic examines the consequences of totalitarianism, mass surveillance, and government repression. Um, as a public media organization, our mission is to connect listeners and members to each other and the world. We have been creating more virtual events for those of us stuck at home or people who still want to find a way to connect to the community around them, like this Diane Ream Book Club. Uh, we see these events from topical conversations uh, in the news to cultural conversations like this monthly book club as a way to do just that. As you probably know, the backbone of, of support for public media and WAMU comes from the public. Support from listeners and members is our most reliable and important source of funding. <coughs> public radio works because listeners who value the service step up and give back. If you have been enjoying these monthly book clubs, we really ask you to consider making a gift of support. You can donate at dianereem.org slash give. So we are grateful for the 848 people who have registered to join us today. And I just realized it's 848 who have joined us. I think that's pretty weird. Uh, this event is being recorded and streamed on Facebook and closed captioning is available. Just click the button on your screen. And now let's start the discussion with the host of our book club, Diane Ream. Hi, Lynn. Thank you so much for being with us to introduce what I regard as one of the scariest books I think I've ever read in my life. I've read lots of Stephen King, but nothing has gotten to me the way 1984 has. The title itself has become shorthand to describe the nightmarish authoritarian rule. It introduced terms like Big Brother, Thought Police, Memory Hole, and now some are finding that 1984's messages are more relevant than ever. Joining me today, Yasha Monk. He's contributing editor at The Atlantic, author of The People Versus Democracy, and associate professor at Johns Hopkins University. Welcome, Yasha. So glad to have you. Thank you so much, Diane, for having me. And Lainey Zumas. She's director of the creative writing program at Portland State University and author of Red Clocks, which was shortlisted for the 2019 Orwell Prize for political fiction. Welcome, Lainey. So Thank happy you. to have you. Thank you. And our third guest, Michael Sheldon. He's the author of Orwell, the authorized biography and professor of English at Indiana State University. Now, we do have a great many questions that have already come in from our hundreds of <laughs> listeners, but if you'd like to add your own, you can feel free to do that using the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. And we all hope to work in just as many 
as we can. So, Lainey, let me start with you and get you to tell us about Oceania, <laughs> the fictional place that Orwell was writing about. And we heard the music at the opening here that was part of the movie that came out in 1984, uh, this novel. So tell us about Oceania. Sure, so um, in Orwell's Imagine, in, in the dystopia of 1984, the world is kind of split into three sections, Oceania, East Asia, and Eurasia. And Oceania um, comprises a lot of the sort of uh, the, the the Americas and um, and I and the the island of Great Britain or what was once Great Britain and you know the which is now called Airstrip One um, and so there's been um, a kind of almost uh, bringing together in a more simple way some of the uh, antagonisms that um, that exist in the world but um, the, the most one of the most important things about Oceania is its relationship to the past and its ability to erase and change the past according to the needs of the, the present. And so I think that's one of the scariest parts of the book that anything that happened before can be changed yeah. or simply eliminated. Right. And it's as though the past does not exist. It's only the present for as long as it exists. And then moving forward, the present no longer exists. So it's, it's really kind of frightening in that very way. Yasha Monk, can you tell us a little bit about Winston Smith? He's uh, quite a character. Well, he is quite a character, and in a way, he's not that extraordinary a character, which is to say that I think he's supposed to be a little bit of an everyman. Um, he uh, does not start with any particularly strong political conviction. He works himself as a sort of wider part of a regime. He's a member of the outer party, so he's not a sort of very uh, important figure within the political party that sort of sustains his regime, which is modeled after Stalin Soviet Union, so it's a kind of uh, Communist Party, I suppose. He's not in the inner sanction of it, but he is a member of it. And he, he himself has this everyday job of adjusting the past, of memory holding uh, past events and people. Um, but he is sort of slowly driven towards expressing himself in private in his diary about his actual thoughts about the situation. He has scratches of memory that actually the claim is that uh, uh, you know, his, his state has always been uh, in conflict with Eurasia, but actually he seems to remember that that wasn't the case, that at some point Eurasia had been their friends and suddenly it became their enemy and they pretended that it had always been the case and so on and so forth. Um, and so he has this deep desire to actually be true to himself and to speak the truth and to seek human connection, all of which is discouraged. Um, but I think there's also, um, and, and, and I trust I'm not giving any, anything away here, uh, the, the opposite instinct is in him too. And after a lot of bravery and a lot of torture in the end, he does actually give in to his temptation to love Big Brother. And so I think um, we see through Winston uh, both the ways in which people are driven to rebel when they are told to accept something, to believe something, to parrot something they don't believe, but also the instinct that all of us have, including the wonderful, lovable protagonist of this novel, to in the end give in and just go along with the flow. And I think that's one of the things that make him very powerful. And it, as a matter of fact, Winston Smith, Michael, works for the Ministry of Truth, as Yasha says, which is certainly ironic because he is erasing the past, erasing what has gone before and pushes through what Big Brother wants. Explain to us, Big Brother. 
Well, first of all, we don't even know that he physically exists. I think one of the brilliant strokes that Orwell created in this book was to make it clear that what we would call today a virtual presence is what Big Brother is, that he's, he's whoever they want him to be, the party wants him to be. So he could be a Hitler figure, he could be a Stalin figure, he could be any real figure, but he's not. And I think the fact that he's virtual is part of the secret of his success, is that he's the he's sort of the precursor of the world that we live in now, where we're in more of a, a digital virtual world. That's what we're on right now, isn't it? Um, where manipulation of the kind that's done at the Ministry of Truth can be done fairly easily today. And I think it's fascinating that Orwell, before he wrote this book, had only two full-time jobs in his whole life, salaried jobs. One was with the Indian Imperial Police. He was a policeman in uh, Burma for five years. And then the other one was working for the BBC for two years. Huh. And in both cases, he was exposed to very typical British organizations full of bureaucracy, full of paperwork. And I think he came to understand how easily this paper, this mound of paper that was used in both organizations to keep track of so many things could be manipulated. And of course, now with everything moved from the old analog world to the digital world, we can manipulate at will. And we do. Um, I'm interested, uh, Lainey, in Julia and O'Brien, two important figures. O'Brien seems kind of in the background initially, but Julia comes forth as such an important character. Yeah, she's um, she works in the fiction department um, <laughs> at the ministry, and they have these machines that generate uh, plots for novels, which I. I'm always fascinated by that little tidbit. <laughs> um, and she, and Winston has noticed her and, and he's a little paranoid, wondering if she's following him, if she's you know part of the thought police. And one day she manages to get him a note that says simply, I love you. And that begins, um, and, and I think it's important to say actually, b before he has contact with her directly, he has a lot of um, pretty violent, fantasies about her he uh, raping her killing her you know smashing her head against like the cobblestones and um something on on like this reread of 1984 i was i was more attuned to than i think in in past reads i had been about um just the the, the kind of ways that misogyny functions in the in you know this dystopia um and the kind of fear of women, um, and, and also the, the resentment against women that, um, that, you know, Winston perceives like, oh, she won't have sex with me. So like, I'm kind of mad at her. And, um, but then once they do get together, we, the reader experiences their relationship as this kind of countervalent force against, um, uh, against the deadening effects of uh, all the surveillance and, um, of the regime and 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 so kind of awakening Winston as like no he does want to live um, because of this relationship and his life Yasha is so miserable he goes from home to work to home he barely has enough to eat but the one thing everyone in Oceania Oceania has is gin so Bad gin. <laughs> despicable horrible tasting gin now why do you think that is and your microphone is off good now um yeah I, I i retain the liberty to switch on and off my the microphone unlike the people in oceania right who are con continually watched and you know um, uh, there's not a moment when, when, when they don't have to present themselves to the world, which I think, by the way, is a really interesting 
theme with today as well. Um, whether it's in the political arena where people feel like they have one diverging opinion when people are gonna beat up on them about it, um, or just the way in which many teenagers in a completely apolitical way feel like they have to present themselves to the world on social media and so on, right? Um, so there's sort of, you know, sorry, I'm, I know I'm not answering your, your question. Um, well, I, I, I think Winston is kind of, he's a funny figure, isn't he? I mean, he um, is, is pushed to political activity and he's not, somebody who, 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 who seeks it out. And so that's why I think he has this way in which we can identify with him. He's not the sort of courageous person who comes in and he was a resistance fighter and he has these sort of deep ideas and he's always struggled against them. Um, we, we start off feeling that he is somebody who we relate to, um, uh, who, who, who has to go through the motions, who has to go through this very hard everyday life um, but, but he takes on something extraordinary, right? He becomes a kind of heroic figure, even though he's a failed hero in the end. And I think, uh, you know, seeing this, 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 this very drab existence in the day to day, um, it obviously shows the sort of the fear that a totalitarian regime like that is not going to lead to the affluence that it promises. I think that's clearly one of the political points that's being made there. But I think it also has the uh, personal dimension of making us relate to him better. And I think what I, you know, I, re I read the, first, the novel the first time four years ago. I'd always been put off the idea of it, even though I loved George Orwell, because it's such a well-trodden cliche, right? Oh, Big Brother and Double Think and Memory Hall, and we all sort of know about it, and it feels a little bit worn at this point, precisely because it's so famous. And, and, and what, what moved me about the book, uh, when I first read it and when I reread it now, is the way that it really works on two levels. I mean, it is a brilliant political polemic and a brilliant political warning, but it's clearly haunting in all kinds of political contexts. But it works as a story. It works as a book. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. the way in which we relate to Winston and the way in which he has to suffer through this drabness is part of what makes that uh, function. Michael, uh, Winston commits an act of rebellion by hiding in the corner of his apartment and writing something in his diary. Why is that such a momentous act? Well, you, you can see it with uh, the very creation of this book. You can see it with the creation of, of 1984, which for Orwell was a very uh, political act. He wanted to make a statement. The original title of the book was called the last man in Europe, as though to suggest that the, the truth would come down to the last person willing to tell it. And I think uh, Orwell felt that the very act of creating this story was defiance. It was a willingness to tell both sides of the political spectrum at the time what he thought was the truth. And um, I think we need to focus at some point on the fact that the heart of this book is something that troubles me a lot about today, and that is the two minutes hate. The idea that you can get uh, people so roused up to yell, in today's world, lock her up or lock him up or whatever at these rallies, you can, you can energize, if that's the right word for it, your, your base to be filled with hate rather than with some more positive force. And that's one of the most potent things at the heart of 1984, the willingness to use hate as a tool, a political tool, to advance your cause. And by hate, of course, we mean virulent hate, uh, the kind of hate that we also see in these fantasies of Winston's toward women or toward anyone. It's, it's a society built on hatred and anger and, and uh, vengeance. And one yeah. other word, I'm sorry, Lainey, I was just going to ask about one other word, treachery, Michael, because that to me is what O'Brien represents. How does he fit into this novel? Yes, because betrayal is, is part of what happens when hate takes effect. If, if there was ever any affection between Winston and O'Brien, there seems to have been a sort of a gentleness initially of, of his approach toward Winston, and then it becomes 
more and more evil and, uh, and hate-filled to the point where it seems methodical. It's a, it's a part of the plan to, to, in a sense, seduce people into a kind of perversion of love. We, we can't forget that the last words of the book are, he loved Big Brother. And that's what O'Brien is able to, to create. He's able, through hate, to create a kind of perverse form of love, meaning a kind of blind allegiance uh, in which treachery, betrayal, all these other things come to play. It's, it's brilliant, actually. Lainey, I'm sorry to have interrupted you. Please go on with your comment. Oh, yeah. I just um, in response to, you know, along the lines of what Michael's describing, there is an ecstasy um, in mm -hmm. and a safety in in kind of being, you know, during the two minutes hate, standing there shouting at the screen and um, kind of feeling oneself connected with all these other people in this common cause, which the, the, the actual object of it becomes irrelevant, right? The, the, you know, what we're hating, but it's, it's that desire to be in the, the safe haven, so to speak, of this, this union with other people and say like, as long as I'm standing here screaming with everyone else who's screaming, like, I'm okay. Um, and I think that, and, and also to Yasha's point about um, the, you know, how much we're immersed in the discomfort of Winston's life and the, the dreariness. And I think, um, you know, that's something fiction can do that a lot of other uh, kinds of, you know, media can't. I mean, we can have, you know, have a discussion about totalitarianism or um, capitalism versus socialism, but like to actually experience um, the this sort of really desolate life of you know bad gin and and kind of loneliness and then you know some of the only pleasure available in the life is to be connected with other people against something yeah sure you want to add to that yeah I, I i guess i would just you know like 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 laney and michael i recognize the very obvious resonance with a trump era um, and the way in which the two minutes hate feels like a lot of the rallies that we saw in 2016, um, and that I guess we still to some extent see uh, even through this pandemic, uh, unbelievably enough. Um, but, but I think what's brilliant about this book is that it sort of reveals to us the inst that, that this instinct is a universal human one, and that we all potentially have it, and that it's not the preserve of one mm -hmm. particular political system or political direction. So. Um, you know, I, you know, when I look at Twitter, I, I, I see people on the left and the right in the center and in every other political direction, people who are, you know, passionate vegans and people who are ideological meat eaters, um, uh, be capable of engaging in what I see as versions of that two minute hate. Now, obviously it's very different. It's not at the behest of a totalitarian system and it's not directed by a powerful political figure and that makes it different. Um, but I do think it shows us uh, that that all has recognized something universal in humanity here, and that actually it is uh, part of a political project and 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 the private project that everybody is responsible for to make sure that society doesn't devolve into that. But the danger of that always lies, uh, it always exists in every society because it lies within our own psychology. I was fascinated with the changing of numbers, Michael, chocolate for example, and the production of chocolate and the fact that the production had actually gone down, but in the eyes of Big Brother, it went up. How did they accomplish that? Well, actually, there again, you have a, a, a model at the time that Orwell's writing the book. He had, he had endured, the British people had endured rationing of nearly every major staple. By the time the socialist government in the late 1940s was in power, they were rationing tea, potatoes, uh, fruit of, of all kinds. There was a bacon ration, there was a meat ration. And living in that rationing society from the war to the post-war period became more and more bizarre because at one point, even soap was unavailable. And you begin to think, why is it that I'm not getting these goods? And in a sense, when Orwell escaped to the Isle of Jura, 
he was escaping to a world where there could be no rationing because you didn't really need staples there. The nearest store on Jura in those days was about 25 miles away. So most of what you had, you made, you could fish in the sea, you could hunt. It was primarily there for hunting. And so Orwell was kind of like a, a Thoreau figure in many ways in Walden, writing this lonely book about his solitary perspective on a world that seemed to him to have gone mad, where everything was upside down, where in fact, as he puts the equation in the book, two plus two equals five. And war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Tell us how we should understand these statements, Lainey. Um, well, I think, you know, one of the, the fascinating questions in this book um, th throughout is, you know, how do people come to believe something and does the belief itself uh, become more important than, than any actual relationship to objective truth? And, and so um, this notion that uh, if, you know, if someone is, is free, is sort of taken care of by the state, like, you know, told what to do and, um, you know, every, every bit of their lives is constrained, um, there is actually a, you know, a freedom in that, um, and that's what people are, are supposed to come to believe. We, we sort of see the evidence of that, especially, and, you know, as Michael was talking about this, this notion of scarcity, I think is really important, and it applies to our, our lives in America today, where we are an incredibly wealthy, like, I mean, just ridiculously wealthy nation. There's so much abundance, and yet so many people live um, in poverty, um, financial precarity, different kinds of, um, you know, they can't get health care. And, and I think that kind of relates to this, um, the, the jarring cognitive dissonance of like, wait, aren't we, aren't we in a country that is, that has a lot of money and resources and yet how, how is my life or, you know, the life of an individual um, so deprived, right? And, and that, you know, so the slogans themselves um, become almost stand-ins for this, this way that people are asked to live where what they're seeing in front of their eyes, like they're being told like that's not evidence of anything. Exactly. Um, yeah. The only thing of abundance, Yasha, is gin. <laughs> You're obsessed with his gin, Diane. You keep going back to the gin. <laughs> I do because it's a controlling, it's a controlling liquid, and it's provided again and again before a cup is even emptied. It's refilled. Why is gin so central? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, gin is the sort of stereotypical English drink, right? I mean, when I went to college in England, um, you know, even as a, you know, I think in, in the States, you don't think of, you know, 18, 19 year olds drinking a lot of gin, but we would have gin and tonics in the college bar. Um, so, so I think part of it is just that that is actually probably a, a drink that a lot of people had um, that was relatively cheaply available. Um, the, the, the idea, you know, that, that everybody needs something to escape and that alcohol obviously is, is something that allows people to sort of calm down, right? I mean, even the sort of uh, slightly sexist cliche of a sort of mom who sort of needs a glass of white wine at the end of like a long day with the kids, right? Um, I think speaks to that. Um, you know, I'm reminded a little bit of a really interesting article about uh, the, the painkiller epidemic that we have going on at the moment. But it's interesting that those are downers rather than uppers. Uh, that, 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 that the epidemic we're currently going through is not one um, that, that drug epidemic is not one uh, where people are sort of taking, uh, you know, LSD in order to dance all, all night through at the yeah. top of their friends. It's something they take in order to sort of be able to get through the day on their own on the couch. And I wonder whether gin has some sort of similar um, uh, attribute. I don't know, actually. I suppose it's a downer rather than up. I'm not My sure. God, I sort of saw the gin as a means of control to keep that person um, under the thumb, as it were. I'm reminded of that great line of Eliza Doodle in, um, in Pygmalion, My Fair Lady, where she says about um, a drunken uh, relative of hers, she says, gin was as mother's milk to her. Um, 
that's a cheap, and you can have the fancy gin in an Oxford college with their gin and tonic, or you can have pretty cheap gin, and that's what this oh, is. We, we did not have fancy yeah. gin in my Cambridge college, Michael, <laughs> for you. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's a way of keeping peace among the proles, as, as Orwell dubs them. The proles have the opportunity to realize what is being done to them, but before they can do that, they need to have a kind of awakening. And one of the things that keeps them asleep, in a sense, intellectually, are all of these propaganda tools, all of these ministries, but also just down to cheap gin. It's, well, it's they're not allowed to have gin. I thought, aren't the proles only allowed to have beer? They are, but you know, it's, it's a society in which almost anything goes. So the, the, <laughs> the next step up from cheap beer is cheap gin. So you, you create these incentives, illegal or not, mm -hmm. and you, you corrupt the society from the bottom up. And as long as that's the case, there's almost no way out of it unless there is a general awakening in which you leave this stupor of political unconsciousness and become conscious. And that's what Orwell is, is doing, not just with gin, but almost every aspect of the novel is meant to keep the people, the proles, in their servitude. I think so, the division between the proles and uh, the sort of more middle class uh, people that are described uh, is really interesting aspect of this book, right? I mean, again, sort of the, the ruling ideology in Oceania is Ingsoc or English socialism. Uh, with its promise of the abolition of a class society. Um, and what you get here is a very strange portrayal, which I think is quite insightful and, 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 and perhaps spoke a little bit to the reality of communist regimes, uh, you know, in the Soviet Union and elsewhere, where, you know, actually in a way there was, first of all, still a very deep class system, right, where for all of the dreariness and drudgery of, of, of Winston's life that we described, he's in a privileged position within a society. He actually yes. living much better than the proles in a material way. Because he gets he gin, they get you know, bad beer, even worse. Um, but at the same time, there's a liberty to being a pro, that actually, you know, they're so irrelevant in the scheme of things within Oceania that they actually, uh, you know, they can have love affairs more easily. They can, uh, even to some extent, save political opinions more easily. They're sort of less inhibited um, uh, because they don't matter, right? They're not who the party and who the brother is as worried about. I think there's something very interesting here. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I don't think that there's, a, there's an easy parallel here, um, but, but I think in the States today, actually, uh, in a way, the more educated you are, the more you are, uh, you know, in a college educated environment, uh, the, the more people feel that there's a particular view they should have or not have, the more they're actually divided politically. Um, and I think that's often not the case when you go uh, into less elite circles in the United States, where people actually in some ways feel, um, you know, less politically interested and perhaps, a, you know, a little, um, you know, they can, they can have a political fights and go and have a beer afterwards anyway. It actually, yeah. I think, is a less divided country out there uh, across the nation than it is in the most educated enclaves, whether they be liberal or conservative. Blaney, uh, let's talk about the role of sex and intimacy in Oceania and the function of how the party directs uh, that sexual interaction will take place. Yeah, um, I'd like to, um, if I may, read a short passage um, from, the, this is from pages 65 and 66 of, of this edition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is a passage from fairly early on in the book before Winston has started his affair with Julia. The aim of the party was not merely to prevent men and women from forming loyalties, which it might not be able to control. Its real undeclared purpose was to remove all pleasure from the sexual act. The only recognized purpose of marriage was to beget children for the service of the party. Sexual intercourse was to be looked on as a slightly disgusting minor operation, like having an enema. The party did not permit divorce, but rather encouraged separation in cases where there were no children. And, um, and, and quote, and, and you know, the, I'm, 
I'm really struck by the the kind of connections um, and and you know in 1984 it's mostly about legislating you know hetero relationships. I think queer love and queer sex are in the in the margins along with prostitution and these illicit pleasures that um, are, are kind of off stage. But um, uh, the insistence on reproduction and the the fact that you know Winston was allowed to separate from his wife Catherine because they weren't able to have children. Um, and although, you know, Winston, Winston's main complaint was that, you know, Catherine would have sex with him once a week, but wouldn't enjoy it. Right. Um, but, but underneath what's more interesting to me about that, that relationship is the, the sort of framing of a person or a relationship as a failure if children are not produced. And I, and I, and that really gets me thinking to, um, this, the sort of notion of family values in you know, American political culture, which, I think we are wrong to uh, ascribe only to conservative um, politics because I think everywhere, I mean, even if you can hear in um, pro-choice politicians who talk about abortion and say we, it should be safe, legal, and rare as, as though it's this regrettable last resort and, and really the thing that needs to happen is, is for children to be produced, right? And it's sad when that doesn't happen. I mean, and that's, that's really where the, the logic of, of a phrase like that leads. And so, you know, I, I think as as we're thinking about the the, the echoes and resonances um, of Orwell's uh, world with our own, I think just just to think about how um, procreation and and the family are um, are celebrated in a in a way that can actually really reduce people's freedom and bodily autonomy. Michael, do you want to add to that? I think the thing that is missing from the from the society that we're faced with in this book is the whole notion of comfort, that you would be able to take comfort in privacy, comfort in um, in pleasure of of sex or joy of any kind. The the elimination of comfort makes people uh, perhaps easier to control, easier to give them incentives to, to do what you want them to do because you'll give them a little spot of joy deceptively. So it's just, it's a society so corrupt at its heart that the very concept of contentment or comfort, which most societies yearn for, is just almost completely absent from that book. And, and it, uh, I think it's one of the things that, it, the novel doesn't terrify me so much as it does sadden me to mm -hmm. see that human beings allowed themselves or could allow themselves to be reined in and denied their basic comforts in such a way. Here is a question for you, Michael, from Richard, who says, regarding the sources of Orwell's vision, I've read his experience in the constricting atmosphere of censorship and propaganda in the wartime BBC inspired much of 1984, notably his creation of Newspeak. It's, it's true to some extent, of course, there are many inspirations, but obviously working at the BBC in, a, in an environment where they actually had a sensor with a kill switch uh, to turn off his microphone if he happened to stray from his script and almost everything at the BBC had to be produced in terms of scripts read on air rather than ad lib or risk somebody saying something that wasn't uh, acceptable in a wartime situation where they were worried that somehow a, a little fact might slip that might be of help to the enemy. But nevertheless, it was very um, disconcerting to Orwell to be in that system and one of the ways that people sometimes referred to the BBC at the, in those days and later was just the Beeb, which mm -hmm. then would become short for BB. And as you know, a couple of times in, in 1984, Big Brother is referred to as BB. So you've got a little bit of that going. It's so funny today that at the entrance of the BBC in Portland Place in London, they have placed a statue of Orwell, which greets everyone going into the BBC but behind him, they've carved into a, a stone wall these words of Orwell's, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're now, I think, very much on the side 
of telling what they believe to be the truth fearlessly and not uh, censoring. They don't always live up to that, but that's their ideal. And it's an ideal, I think, that's incredible that Orwell has inspired them to live up to. Michael, uh, I presume you did not speak with Orwell himself for your biography, but did, in fact, speak with his wife. Is that correct? No, sp spoke at great length with his son, Richard Blair, spoke at great length with many of his girlfriends. Amazingly, yeah. he had a number of girlfriends going all the way back to a woman named Brenda Salkeld who knew him in the 1920s. So when I got on the trail of researching Orwell in the early 90s, uh, late 1980s, a lot of people were still alive. But unfortunately, Sonia, uh, Sonia Orwell, as she called herself, died in the 1980s, so I didn't get to her. And Orwell died about a year before I was born. So I, huh. I was out on that, I couldn't get to him. But you got to a lot of people who gave you really good insights into his thinking. What was behind that imagination that created this, I use the word terror, this work of terror that we've just read? And so many people, including Stephen Spender, the poet Stephen Spender, who knew him very well, told me that they believed that Spain, his part in the Spanish Civil War, had formed that sense when he was hunted in the streets of Barcelona as supposedly um, a wanted man for, for favoring the wrong political faction during that very complicated civil war. So he went into hiding, he was threatened with arrest and with po possible long imprisonment. Some of his friends were executed in the Spanish Civil War. So living in that reign of terror, many people believed, had the greatest influence on him understanding what could happen when you get inside of a society that's gone mad in that way. Interesting. Here's a uh, comment from Callie in El Paso, Texas, who says, 30 pages into this book, I put it down asking myself, why am I reading this? It's all ugliness, nothing of joy or beauty. Curiosity finally kept me going to the end. Really, too easy to connect with the trajectory of life in the US and among the superpowers right now. Yasha? Well, uh, you know, I guess I go, I, I'll go back to the original title uh, of a book of a, one of the titles that all had considered, uh, you know, The Last Man in Europe. I mean, uh, you know, I think that a lot of his book is beautiful because it uh, depicts the possibility of free thought and the possibility of political courage and the possibility of a connection with another human being, uh, even in times of extreme difficulty. Um, you know, even if that doesn't triumph in the end, uh, to me, that is a very hopeful, inspiring uh, element of this book. And it makes it all more hopeful and inspiring because one of the wonderful things about George Orwell is that he, uh, as, as, as a person, Eric Blair, actually lived up to it in his own life. He never was popular with any faction of politics because he always bristled against the orthodoxies of his own side. And so I think we should also read this book as a challenge to ourselves. So it is very easy to say, hey, the people on the other side who we know are idiots and who we know we dislike, you know, you know here's how it resonates with them or whatever. I think we should also be self-critical enough to think about uh, whether we stand up for people, um, uh, whether we say our opinion clearly, whether we hold back on certain topics, uh, because George Orwell would have liked us to do that. Um, one of the things I love about Orwell is some of his essays. I mean, I think that 1984 is amazing. Animal Farm, which is more bucolic, I think is also a very transient um, a novel of sorts. Um, but, his, but his political essays, I think, are also wonderful. And one that I found myself going back to recently is his defense of P.G. Woodhouse, you know, the author of these sort of very funny satirical novels about Jeeves in Worcester, this um, you know, British aristocrat and his servant, um, uh, you know, set, you know, in a more uh, idyllic world before World War I mostly. Um, 
And what, uh, you, know, you know, but in Woodhouse, during the war, made all the wrong choices, whereas, whereas Orwell had gone to fight on the Republican side in Spain and, uh, you know, spent the war uh, uh, serving the BBC despite his misgivings, um, but in, you know, helping in his way for the cause of defeating Nazi Germany. P.G. Woodhouse had gotten, you know, ended up in house arrest in, in France and actually collaborated briefly with the Nazis on a radio program um, mm. in order to essentially buy his freedom. Um, and so he had really deeply compromised himself and there was a two minutes of hate against P.G. Woodhouse in Britain, uh, denouncing him for his bad choices. Now, again, Orwell, lifelong socialist, very much a left-wing as somebody who, who was one of the first trenchant critics of Hitler and Mussolini and the fascists, wrote an essay during World War II in defense of P.G. Woodhouse because he came to believe that P.G. Woodhouse had been politically naive, that he's a bit of an idiot um, uh, politically, uh, but not that he was a secret Nazi sympathizer or that he, uh, you know, was a fascist. And, 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 you know, Orwell could not keep silent. For it was deeply unfashionable to make this point, for he had no political sympathy for P.G. Woodhouse. And for he didn't even particularly like his novels. Um, he said, I cannot keep silent as this two minutes of hate yeah, against him is going on. I think that's an inspiration to me. Um, uh, and, and we should all think about that, I think, in our own lives. Lainey, I want to ask you about um, betrayal, because I found myself wondering about the gentleman who owned the antique shop where Winston and Julia made their bed which was rented to Winston for $4 a week. He seemed like such a kind, gentle person as we meet him and, and willing to sell, in fact, to Winston the diary in which he first put a few words. Was it he who betrayed Julia? And Winston? I, I think so. I mean, Mr. Charrington with his, uh, with his sort of bumbling, you know, uh, interest in the past, like they still had a, you know, he had still installed a telescreen um, behind the, the picture in, in Which there. They had no um, idea. Of no. And, you know, something about that character that's interesting. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, one of the things I don't think is, is, very successful about um, the novel as a novel is actually Winston and Julia's uh, relationship because when we get, you know, <laughs> there's so many ways that Winston's aware and, and the reader's aware of, you know, Julia's limitations, like she's not that interested in like a lot of these ideas, she falls asleep while he's talking about, um, you know, what he believes. And so when we get to his betrayal of Julia and Julia's of, of Winston, I wasn't terribly moved by that. But Mr. Charrington, it's interesting that you bring him up because I, I found there to be almost more intimacy um, in these like a few little exchanges with Winston because they both care about they care about things that have no uh, usefulness in the present, right? Huh. The little um, thing of coral that Winston you know loves and yeah, paper and, weight. Yeah, and and when that is smashed, like that was actually to me a, a very troubling moment, you know, when when the the, the coral is smashed, but. Um, you know, you, you have this guy who, at, and it, I don't even think it's so much that the, the store owner's pretending, you know, it's that he is maybe caring about those things, but he's also going to betray Winston, you know, and that, that um, kind of internalization of, of duty um, is, you know, if, if you talk about terror, you know, there's, it's terrifying to see a mask with live rats in it put on someone's head, but it's also so terrifying to see so many of these characters um, become willing to um, to submit, right? And so the, the, the point at which we get that, that Winston's like, okay, fine, like I've been tortured for weeks or, you know, months or years and I now I love Big Brother, like that that internalization is, is the scariest to me. I agree with that. Michael, can you talk about the forms of torture that are used to bring Winston around. And finally, that most horrific scene with the rats, at which point I have to Terrible. tell you, 
<laughs> I have to tell you, I normally read at night before I go to sleep. I had to put the book down. I thought, <laughs> I cannot read this now. So it, that's one of the that torture. Yeah, that's one of the insidious aspects is that you, in the Big Brother regime, you design the torture to fit the individual. So there isn't a kind of pervasive waterboarding or some other kind of form of torture that, that works on all sizes. It's, it's the torture that you as an individual fear the most. And that I think is Orwell's way of saying that ultimately it's why it becomes the, the duty of the last man or woman alive as an individual awake and conscious of what the society is becoming. To, to stand up and speak out, to be the brave one, the courageous one, as Orwell himself was in writing this book, rather than allow that last spark of individuality to be snuffed out in a form of torture designed specifically to undermine your will as an individual. That's, that's its point, because other people, I'm sure, might think, uh, rats against their face was in a cage wasn't such a bad idea. They might even find that was intriguing. But for Orwell, that, you know, in that book, it's in 1984, it's terrifying. Um, tell me what the reaction to the book was when it first was published. Huge. It was Orwell's books always got a mixed reaction until Animal Farm in 1945. And then this book came, came out in the summer of 1949, and there were just universal, almost universal cries of praise in both Britain and America. I think someone mentioned in something I'd come across that there were about many different reviews in various newspapers around America within the first month. It was covered entirely everywhere and spoken of with great praise. Uh, Edmund Wilson spoke of it with great praise in the New Yorker. It's, I think everyone understood after the Berlin airlift of 1948, where you had this occupied zone split up like the world is split up in 1984. You, you know, you had the controlling powers fighting over this little piece of territory in, in East Berlin called, you know, the city of Berlin. I think everyone realized that the, the Cold War was beginning to heat up. And so that was the initial response to, to maybe this is the book that will tell us how to face the future. Hmm. But I also now believe the book's taken an entirely different turn in that it speaks more to us about our digital world, about the threats that we face because of the intrusiveness of surveillance and, and other things into our lives that no keystroke goes unrecorded, that sort of thing. It's, it's a new fear that's gripped us today. There is a, a question from Barry who says what fascinated me most about 1984 was Newspeak eventually getting people to not have language for plotting rebellion. If Donald Trump had the capability that Big Brother had, newscasters wouldn't have the ability to air recordings of him saying the opposite of his latest positions. Laney? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I've been thinking about kind of other kinds of, you know, dystopias um, and, you know, Octavia Butler um, with the parable of the sower. I believe um, the, the phrase make America great again is in that book, which came out, you know, in, like, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and, and, and how, <laughs> And, and the emptying out of language, which of course is a huge concern of Orwell's. And, and you know, like Yasha, like I'm, I'm a big fan of um, his essays and especially, you know, this curiosity about what happens with the word like democracy. You know, the, it's a word we all think we understand. Oh, I know what that means or freedom. And yet we, um, our lived experience is often incredibly complicated when it comes to, you know, how, you know what that actually means. And so, um, even in our own moment, I think that um, the language we have becomes so incomplete because it's been emptied out, right? Um, and uh, the, the idea, like, what does it mean to say you want justice, you know? So the question becomes, Yasha, how close 
are we today mm -hmm. to 1984? Well, you know, I was thinking about that as, as, as Michael was comparing it to a sort of digital sphere and, 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 and what Lane was just saying. Look, I think in one way, it's very, very important to say that we're very, very far from that. We don't have, uh, we're not living in a totalitarian system and we're not living, we don't have anybody who can control what is said. I mean, one of the striking things about social media is the extent to which uh, sort of societal gatekeepers have less control over what is said today than probably ever before. Right, any of you who are listening can go to Twitter and Facebook and say something there. And if it's sufficiently viral, lots and lots of people might be able to see that. That is a completely different world from the kind of uh, repression that uh, all is painting in Oceania. I think, though, that in a weird way, we have uh, small elements of newspeak, small elements of oppression, small elements of two minutes of hate that are orchestrated despite our freedom to stand up to it. Um, you know, Donald Trump can motivate people to shout, lock her up, even for everybody would be free to say, no, actually, what are you on about? Why, why on earth should we lock her up? Um, but we also see that, again, um, in other spheres of society. I mean, you know, this year we've had a big controversy on social media and in some newspapers about two plus two is four, because some people were saying, two plus two is four in a kind of political context, and it somehow became coded as being more right-wing for reasons that I don't entirely follow or understand. And suddenly here was a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, a researcher at uh, the Harvard School of Public Health and so on, uh, explaining to us why actually two plus two is five. If you, uh, you know, don't use a base 10 system, but a base two system, or if you think about, you know, you take two machines and two, ingredients of whatever you're producing, you might be able to get, you know, five, uh, you know, and, and there was a serious attempt to try and justify from our side, I certainly see myself as part of that side, the liberal side, well, actually, if you're smart, you realize that two plus two is five, and it was all to own and one up some right-wing commentator who had said two plus two is four in some context. So I think what's the same is this human instinct to want to abuse language if it serves our political purposes, and that's within all of us, and we should all be worried about it, about ourselves. What's not the same is that thankfully we don't live in a totalitarian system uh, like the Third Reich or like the Soviet Union, where there is actually one central political power that is capable of exerting yeah. that kind of control. Yeah. Michael, how would you answer the question, how close are we to 1984 now? Well, of course, in the United States and much of the Western world, we're still far away. But don't forget, there are many parts of the world where people are living under this kind of tyranny and they don't have the freedoms that we take for granted. And I do think that we've given up a lot of our privacy without um, giving it any kind of endorsement. It just, it just disappeared. We would object if someone tapped our phone lines or old landlines. We would know that was wrong. And yet we also know that many people have access to what we do online when we use our cell phones and when we use computers. So there ought to be a greater understanding about what the rights of privacy are. That's at the heart of all this, is the individual's right to privacy, to think his or her own thoughts, to live his or her own life. That's what's really, I think, at stake. And Lainey, your reaction to that question it makes me think of the people, I mean, certainly in other parts of the world, but right here in the United States, um, you know, people who live in fear of being rounded up because they don't have certain documents um, or people who, because of uh, poverty or ill health or disability, don't actually have access to um, some of the same um, kinds of privacy or or even, or freedoms that, that, um, that a lot of us do. And so, I guess, you know, something that's always, it's so frustrating, I, I think, about American exceptionalism is this idea that, like, well, we might have our problems, but we're still better than everyone else. And, you know, a way that I, I would hope that this book could invite us to think is, like, well, you know, what are what are the, the ways in which, like, we are still subject to, you know, um, you know, this stuff is still going on here, too. And that will be the last word. Lainey Zoom us. Yasha Munk, Michael Sheldon, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. A great discussion. I learned 
so much. I'm not going to reread the book anytime <laughs> soon, but you've given me lots to think about. Thank you so much. Thank and you, you. of course, thank you to our wonderful audience for being with us. Please, if you would, take a minute to fill out a short survey about this event that will pop up on the screen. And if you would, consider donating to WAMU. Your financial support is what makes it possible for us to bring you events like this. Go to dianereen.org slash give. And for next month's meeting of my book club, it'll be on Wednesday, November 18th, and we'll be reading a new book. It's called The Lying Life of Adults by Elena Ferrante. Stay tuned to your email for more details. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time.